Okay, welcome back to the uh, final session, those of you. Huge amounts of stamina, congratulations. Um, so we're going to have a look um, discussion now. We're going to talk about MRI. We're going to have another multidisciplinary discussion about some cases shared by Ahmed Sayazna, and then um, some images. And we're finishing with the IOTA um, exam for those of you, I guess, who have not got it. So I'm delighted to introduce Isabel Thomas-Ndegara, who most of you will know um, from Paris, still at Hospital Tenon, I would guess, badly pronounced. She's still speaking to me despite Brexit, which is, I think, quite nice, so that's all right. And um, Isabel, in fact, does ultrasound and MRI and is going to talk to us about classification of ovarian masses with MRI. And I think, as you heard from um, Andrea Rockall when she was answering a question earlier, she has driven a, a very large European study looking at standardized characterization of masses with MRI, which in its own way is, in a sense, perhaps is... Um, separately having set it up is, is doing similar things, I guess, to IOTA in terms of trying to find standardized ways of reporting MRIs for masses. Isabel. Okay, thank you very much to invite me. So the question, you can see there's many questions, but I think the simplified title is MRI and how, when, and which masses we will refer to MRI. So why MRI could be useful? MRI is useful because it helps you to recognize cystic component because thanks to the characteristic of this uh, cystic fluid you can see that combining sequences we are able to recognize water fat blood mucin and also we will we will able to characterize benign and malignant tissue especially adding functional sequences and for them who were uh, were in this auditorium yesterday uh, you uh, listened to a very uh, nice lecture for Dr. Camelate, and we proved that there was a correlation between the time intensity curve and the immaturity of the microvessels of malignant tumor, especially in invasive tumor. And in that case, we observe a curve steeper than that of myometrium, typically in invasive tumor. We are able also to recognize benign tissue when the enhancement is weak and progressive with a plateau in benign lesion, and when it's moderate with a plateau, we observe this curve in borderline and in low-grade cystalinocarcinoma. So how we will analyze? I propose you a very simple approach in uh, three steps. The first question always when we have to characterize the pelvic mass is, what's the origin of the mass? Because finally, sometimes the patient is referred for an excel mass and the mass is not, don't come from the ovary. Then we will have to evaluate the risk of malignancy. And to evaluate this risk of malignancy, we'll answer in three steps to three questions. First question is, is there internal enhancement? Because the added value of MRI, if when there's no internal enhancement, there's no malignancy. Sometimes we'll discover internal enhancement, for example, when there is smooth septa, but the smooth septa do not correspond to solid tissue exactly with the same definition than the other definition. So the second question we have to answer is, is there solid tissue? Because if there's no solid tissue, you have a very lo low risk of malignancy, lower than 5%. And the last question, when we discover solid tissue, we will be able to characterize it with diffusion and perfusion. And this is really the first step. And the second step, adding other criteria, including the age, the morphology of the tumor, we will be able to make pathological hypothesis. We resume that in a in a publication because we attempt to make a score combining all these features and this publication was ba based on a retrospective monocentric study including 497 tumors and we make a multivariate analysis with an external validation in a validating, validating set and this score obtained an accuracy very high, 96.3% with a five category scoring system depending on the positive predictive value of malignancy. Here is the score. The name is also URAT score because we are, we have, we are performing a European validation. So it's European Adnexal MR score system, so URAT score. And you can say, T, that 
the first question I, I say is, is, what is there any an Excel mass? Because it's, the mass is not an Excel mass, it's a score one, and we don't have to characterize according to this criteria. Second score, it's a score two, and you can see it's a very low risk of malignancy. It's a, a risk lower than two percent, and in this category, you have the unilocular simple cyst or tube, like in this example, very bright on T2, low T1, and low gadolinium. There's no enhancement in all this lesion. Second lesion, endometriotic lesion. Uh, we are able to recognize endometriotic component because when we look at the T1 sequence, the endometriotic signal is very bright. And when there's no internal enhancement, also the lesion is very highly probably benign. Also, when we are able to discover fat, it's very easy using MRI because we have sequence with and without fat separation. So when the lesion display bright signal on T1 and this signal disappear after fat separation, no problem, it's very easy. It's fatty content and we know that when there is a fatty lesion without any uh, solid tissue, always it's, it's benign. The last, the, the lesion also we can rate at score two. It's when there's no wall enhancement because we know that malignant tumor have always a wall enhancement. So no wall enhancement, no malignancy. And the last lesion you can rate at a score two is when you discover solid tissue that display low T2 weighted signal and low diffusion weighted signal. It's dark, dark, like we say, we say in radiology. Score three, probably benign, lower than five percent. We include in this category the ulnarcular non-simple cyst, excluding the two cysts in, uh, which are rated score two, excluding fatty and endometriotic cysts. Also, multilocular cyst without solid tissue, and lesion with solid tissue with a time intensity curve type one. You remember, a progressive without plateau. Score four, it's uh, a lesion with. Uh, indeterminate lesion, finally. It's lesion with solid tissue that enhance according to time intensity curve type two. And finally, score five, you can see that's a very high risk of malignancy with a time intensity curve, the, tissue, the, the tumor with the time intensity curve type three or lesion with, which are associated with peritoneal implants, but usually they are not referred to MRI, they are referred to CT scan or uh, whole body MRI. So we, uh, are con we, are, we are finished to recruit the patient in this study. It's a large European study with 14 centers. And the first result, our result on, on tumor that we uh, were managed by surgery. That's another part of tumor which are um, just referred for follow-up. And you can see that we obtained the very important thing was the negative predictive value, which quite because it's very important to not miss cancer or the low number as possible of cancer with a high sensitivity. When we look at the positive predictive value of different category, we are able also to, to recognize the very low risk in this um, lesion. You can see that score one, score two, there was no cancer. In the score three, there was six cancer, so a PPV of 5.3%, but probably with the overall population, this PPV will decrease because I hope that in patients we re refer for follow-up, there was no, no so much cancer. And we have a score four with a positive predictive value of 59.7, and score five always very high, 90.2%. So the third question I have to answer, which masses we refer in this study? We, will, we based the study on pattern recognition and we refer to, for MRI these four last patterns. That means we don't refer the urinocular simple cyst, we don't refer uh, non simple unilocular cyst, but we refer multilocular cyst without solid tissue, cyst with papillary projection, mixed mass, and purely solid mass. And the way to select patients would be to uh, use. Uh, simple rules, especially uh, sp when we have an inconclusive uh, result of simple rules, uh, it could be interesting to have the evaluation using MRI. So it's a case for Antonia, <laughs> for it's a patient who is uh, pregnant, and so my question exactly as previously is, is this lesion is a decidual endometrioma or is it a malignant lesion? If we look at MRI, very simple MRI, only 
T2 and T1 sequence in this patient, you can see that the signal of this um, solid component here, which protrudes in the cyst, it's a nebriotic cyst, yes, it's very bright on T1. You can see the signal is intermediate T2 signal. And this suggests malignancy because when we compare with a deciduized endometrioma, you can see that the T2 signal of the solid component is very, very bright on T2. So this, is, this could be helpful to distinguish a malignant transformation from decidualization. Another example to illustrate this morning. This morning we discussed about rare tumors and I can show you what we find in MRI when we uh, look at this lesion. It's a young, young patient. It's purely solid, large tumor. You can see there is lobulated margin and also something which is very characteristic of this lesion. It's fibrovascular septa, you can recognize there. And also, you can see that septa, there's hemorrhagic content of this septa. The time intensity curve was very suspicious, so it looks like malignant lesion. And in that case, it looks like the pathologic uh, definition of this morning. This was a zdigiaminoma. So, I have a problem because the wide majority of, the, of you don't trust me, I think. And I'm not sure I convince you only on these two cases I am <laughs> right to perform MRI imaging. So I will have, I hope, 15 minutes to convince you on different clinical cases. And uh, I uh, take these cases from the first URAD certification, which occurred yes yesterday afternoon. And I thank Dirk and Tom to give us the opportunity to, for, to organize this URAD certification. And I will show you some results from the people who performed this certification. So clinical case one, that was a 42-year-old woman without children and pregnancy. There was a context of dysmenorrhea. So benign or malignant? Benign. Okay, malignant. Okay, nobody work, <laughs> nobody play. It's done too late in the, in the afternoon. Here are the results when I asked the people to apply the simple rules and see that most of them uh, answer, okay, it's an inconclusive lesion, I need more. And here are the MRI. So if we look at the MRI, you will always have the T2, T1, T1 after fat suppression, and T1 after fat suppression and gadolinium injection. So if you remember, first question, is it an ovine mass? The answer is yes. I can, I, 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 I'm sure it's, it's an ovine mass. Second question is, is there internal enhancement? So what do you think? We compare T1 without injection, T1 with injection, and when we compare these two lesions, th these two images, there's no difference. So there was no internal enhancement. So if there's no internal enhancement, there's no solid tissue. And see, if we look at the signal, it's very bright on T1. It's higher uh, than fat, so it suggested endometriotic component. So it looks like an endometriotic component, no uh, internal gadolinium enhancement, so it looks like score two. And when we look at the answer, most of people answer score two. This lesion was it was really a score two, and this was uh, there was no enhancement. So the D different diagnosis you can have is hematosalpinx or endometrioma. We know that hematosalpinx, there is a wall enhancement. In endometrioma, there's no wall enhancement. So in that lesion, that was an endometrioma. Second case, it's a 40-year-old woman without children, chronic pelvic pain. And so always the same question. The color Doppler was a score two. And uh, is it benign or malignant? Benign? Okay, perfect. Malignant? Okay. The answer, simple rules. We can see it's uh, partly inconclusive or benign. So, uh, half of people answer inconclusive and half people benign. A uh, little of them answer malignancy. And when we look at the MRI and we attempt to apply the score, first question, is there internal enhancement? Yes or no? Is there something that enhances in the, the lesion? When perhaps the only thing that enhances could be the 
smooth septa, but it's very regular, okay? So if the, the answer of internal luminescence is yes, there's no solid tissue inside, okay? So it's very important. And when we uh, look at, finally, there's no typically fatty content because there's no difference between before and after fat suppression. There's no typically endometriotic content in this lesion. And uh, there is wall enhancement, so we can't rate as a score two. So there's no solid tissue. Since so there's no solid tissue, it, could, it can be a score four or score five. It must be a score three, and that corresponds to a multilocular cyst without solid tissue. So we'll see the answer. When we look at the answers, you can see most of people answer URAD three, and that was a good answer. And, and if we, we analyze everything we have, we have a lesion which is quite bright, not so bright for an endometriotic lesion, but sometimes we know that when the endometric content is in a salpunx, you can have uh, a, a different uh, signal, and in that case, that corresponds to endometriotic endometrosalpunx, so benign lesion. Clinical case three, it's interesting. I think no problem for you. Benign, malignant, okay, it could, yes, it looks like malignant because there is some solid uh, component that protrude in a cyst. There's a color Doppler, so no problem. And most of people, when they apply simple rules, answer malignancy. But finally, what the issue for this lesion? What's the real question? Malignant, yes, but the problem is to know if it's a borderline lesion or an invasive carcinoma. And using, an, using ultrasonography, we can see this morning and yesterday, not always very easy to make the difference using uh, ultrasonographic findings. Here are the MRI, T2-weighted MRI. You recognize here the cyst, where's the solid, probably the solid tissue there. We are sure it's solid tissue because when we compare before and after gathering injection, there is an enhancement, so there is a solid tissue. And I explain you, when there is a solid tissue, we need to characterize using diffusion and perfusion. When we look at the diffusion, the, the diffusion you can see it's bright, it's on diffusion. And we look at the containment and city curve. Here is the myometrium. Here is the tumor. So it's a time intensity curve type two. So the score is probably a score four. And what they answer, yes, most of people answer you're at four. And so we know that it's an intermediate lesion, and so we will need to correlate other criteria to go further than just possibly malignant. And when we look at the morphology, I think it's very interesting using MRI. Here you have the ultrasonographic uh, uh, features, and look at that. It's completely different when you look at. You, can, you easily can recognize the papillary projection according pathological definition, and also you are totally, you can recognize there the vascularizing tree we have in borderline lesion, and this lesion was a borderline serous cyst adenoma. Clinical case four here, benign or malignant. Benign, malignant. Okay, like during the, the, the questionnaire yesterday, most of people say, okay, it's probably malignant, this lesion. So we will look at the MRI. And when we look at the MRI, you have T2, T1, T1 after fat suppression, and T1 after fat suppression and gadolinium injection. So my first question, always the same, is, is there internal enhancement? No, there's no internal enhancement. You can see the lesion is brighter than, than there, so there's no internal enhancement. So that means if there's no internal enhancement, there's no solid tissue. So the lesion is either a score two or a score three. And if we look at the content, the cystic content, it don't look endometriotic fluid because it's not bright on T1. It's not also fatty content because it's bright on T1, but it's moderate, moderately bright on T1 after fat suppression. So it's possibly blood, not endometriotic content, but blood, yes. And there is also a wall enhancement, and this is corresponding to a functional cyst. And it's uh, what we can see with fibrinous component inside. Uh, we have, an, in, when you perform an MRI, it's
it's, not, it's rare because usually functional cysts, we don't need MRI, but sometimes you can see it could be complicated using ultrasonographic findings. And in that case, it was very easy on MRI to recognize the answer two or three. Not everybody was not agree, but finally, most of people think, okay, it's probably benign because it's uh, lower than five percent using MRI, and the right diagnosis was functional lesion. Clinical case five, okay, it's a uh, 53-year-old uh, uh, premenopausal woman with chronic pelvic pain, and when we look at ultrasonography, we have this mass with color Doppler inside. So, who think it's benign? Okay, who think it's malignant? Okay, more, okay. And also, when we, they answer simple rules, a part say, okay, it's inconclusive, another part malignant, very few of them, them, okay, it's benign. And once you look at the MRI, what we see, first of all, is there internal enhancement? What do you think? Before, after gadolinium, yes or no? Yes, sure, yes. Okay, is it solid tissue? Yeah, it's only solid tissue. <laughs> it's a purely solid lesion. You can see it's like that, and everything enhances after getting an injection. So you need to analyze the diffusion and also the T2 signal, because you can see that if there's both dark signal on T2 and on diffusion, it's benign. And when we look at the signal here, it's dark. Here, it's dark. So this lesion is benign. We can score this lesion as a score 2. And when we look at the answers, you can see that most of people say that, but some people do not consider the association between the T2 and the diffusion. They just analyze the curve, but don't perform a curve when you have a dark T2 and dark diffusion. It's probably benign. So I have no time to just take the correction of the, the last cases. I go to the last one. And here is the clock. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, we just it was to introduce the next study, which will be begun just, uh, I think, in the next week. Uh, we'll begin this Yotamer study. It's uh, based on the CIPA rules, and we will refer patients where there is an inconclusive result to MRI. It's a multicentric study, well, to include 250 uh, patients, and I'm sure this study will be also a very good study with very friendly relationship that we can see uh, in this uh, first certification of the Yota ultrasonographic features in the European Congress of Radiology in Bordeaux last September. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Isabel, that's uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Misty, what happens in the States with MRI? I mean, to what extent is it used? Is it with Misty here? Are you there? Sorry? Misty. I was going to ask Misty from the States. Do you want to comment? I mean, would you, I mean, it obviously depends on people's clinical, what's good in their department. But I think it's interesting because we've been trying to speak with um, about guidelines in the States about characterizing masses. And you know that um, in, in, there are some who would literally almost say MRI every single mass, as far as I can see. But yeah. where, where do you think it sits in America? Um, given the expense of MRI in yeah. America? Um, we're highly unlikely to use it unless it's a mass that's so big that you're not certain that you can see the entire thing or, in our case, a very yeah. morbidly obese population you might, um, or in pregnancy is another. But we're, we really don't use MRI very much um, unless it's for those specific indications because of the marked added expense. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't add much to the preoperative assessment. The, the problem of the expense is we must compare an unnecessary and appropriate surgery with an appropriate MRI. And probably we need to perform a study for that because sometimes it would be better to avoid an a, a surgery for functional sex, for example, or a tumor in a premenopausal in menopausal woman and over in fibroma. Just, yes, it's difficult sometimes to crack drive yes, it in ultrasonography that. if the MRI is able to, to say, okay, I'm sure it's benign. It could be useful, but there's no proof. We need to prove that. And we we will probably we in our experience when we uh, reclassify the lesion and we compare with the prospective management of patients in the retrospective monocentric study, we um, conclude that in 15% of patients, we would avoid unnecessary surgeries. That means 
population that are not larger than six centimeters and where there's no symptom, no pain, no problem of fertility, anything like that. So yes, probably we have to compare and perhaps, perhaps it could work, I don't know, but we need proof. Isabel, thank you very much, but I'd like you to stay, if you could, because we're going to go on and um, uh, that, that doesn't mean you could, could give us some applause, that'd be nice, no, but we could, <laughs> we, um, thank you. So, um, Isabel, do you want to hang on, do, where are you, who's doing what? So we're going to do a multidisciplinary meeting, similar to what we had um, before, to discuss some cases. This is going to be run by Ahmed Siasna, who's a um, gynae cancer surgeon at St. Thomas's, but also did his um, PhD in ultrasound as well. Um, Isabel is going to be um, taking part. And I think we should have one other person. Daniela, is she still here? Daniela, do you want to take part in this as a second oncologist? Provide a different view. If you want to come and have a seat on the red chairs, the chairs of shame. And we'll um, make a start. Perfect. So, Ahmed, do you want to get going? And um, we Thank can you. take it from here. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, I am going to present uh, a three cases, if we can. Uh, if not, we present two cases. Uh, I've been told that we are short of time and I need to be on time. So, I work in St. Thomas's. The first two cases I'm going to present are Ghani oncology cases. Uh, from St. Thomas Hospital, or guys in St. Thomas Hospital. So the first case, uh, she's a 78-year-old lady, and she's referred from a secondary unit with urinary symptoms, urgency, frequency, dysuria, for a few months. The pelvic mass, or well, there was a pelvic mass, which was uh, felt at examination. The performance status is zero, Tumor markers, CA125 is 109, and the CEA is 12. The ultrasound scan image, transabdominal ultrasound scan, showed a uh, multilocular solid mass uh, on the ovary. Uh, measured, I would say, about 117 millimeters in the largest diameter. The color doubler, so abdominal ultrasound scan. Vaginal ultrasound scan, similar findings. You can see that it is a multilocular solid with high vascularity. That's another view of the cyst or the mass. We used, uh, if you use the ADNIX model, and we filled the parameters, uh, including the CA125, the model will give us a high risk of malignancy of 52.3 for stage two to four uh, ovarian malignancy. This patient went for a CT scan first because we don't normally do an MRI. But the CT scan picked up uh, sigmoid, uh, a large bowel involvement. Uh, so we arranged as well MRI for further characterization and a chest CT. This is not okay. a very good MRI, but this is, this is a T, T2, is okay. it? I have only one image. Yeah, T2, <laughs> T2. Uh, MRI. But finally, if you have an involvement of the thing where you don't need MRI, you need staging. So yes, we can see so that, yes, prob probably, but we don't have injection. There is a mixed mass with a possibly solid tissue at the anterior part and multilocular uh, cyst at the posterior part. So it's a complex lesion, but without any other sequence, I can go further than ultrasonography, and that's why pro so probably when we do an mass. MRI, it's useful to have a full MRI. And if, if we, yes. have, we, look at, we, we don't do better than ultrasonography with only this, sure. this, uh, this sequence, I think. Sure. Uh, the mass was characterized malignant as well on the MRI reports, and the CT and the MRI showed a lesion uh, in the sigmoid. Uh, the lesion in the sigmoid is connected to the pelvic mass, uh, and it is involving the lumen of the sigmoid. So the next decision was to take a biopsy uh, from the mass and a biopsy from the uh, colonoscopy to check if this is different or this is the same mass. But as well, we did the 
CT chest, <laughs> and what we found, we found as well um, a lump there. Very suspicious nodule. <laughs> yeah, in <laughs> the nodule upper right so yeah, apex. The right chest, in and the upper part of the right chest. Uh, yeah. So we decided as well, we thought this is a biopsy. bit of a weird yeah. pattern, so we decided to biopsy this one as well. So the mass from the, or the biopsy from the mass was a carcinosarcoma, ovarian. The biopsy from the sigmoid was a bowel adenocarcinoma. The biopsy from the EBUS, biopsy lung lesion, was an adenocarcinoma of the lung with TTF1, TTF1 positive. That means a non-small uh, lung cancer. So we decided this lady has got three primaries, a lung cancer, sigmoid cancer, and an ovarian cancer. So what's the next step, you think, uh, Daniela? Yeah, that's, that's very nice diagnosis that you really settled uh, three primary malignancies. And now we should discuss uh, the performance status was excellent. Yeah. So she can start chemotherapy, which would be sensitive to all three cancers. Of course, um, the bowel and the ovarian cancer will be sensitive to platine, either oxaliplatin or cisplatin or carboplatin. And the same is true for the lung. So I would start probably with platine-based uh, chemotherapy combined maybe with paclitaxel. Okay. Uh, even if you know that we think the lymph nodes with the lung, will that this change your decision? Is it not difficult to stage the lung? Or they thought the lymph nodes were involved okay. as N2, but that would push for more chemo, I agree. But if the lymph nodes are not involved and it's a stage one lung lesion, will you still give chemo or will you consider surgery? If it would be operable in all three localities, then uh, it would be a very good option. Jan Frank, who wants to have a comment, is that right? We're going to have some, a pathological comment. Either that or your hand gesture is very rude. Yes, I want to add uh, only one thing. P probably I advise uh, to perform a genetic test for this yeah. patient because uh, she has colon carcinoma plus carcinosarcoma of the, U of the ovary that generally come from endometrioid type. So possible... She and the, her family has a Lynch syndrome. I think, uh, I don't know if there is another therapy for Lynch syndrome patients. Could, you t uh, could we have the mic on at the lectern, if there's anyone at the back, please? I just wanted to say, how will this change the decision of the management if you know that she's got gene mutation? Yeah, so, so we still need to give a chemo or surgery. So what, we, yeah, so what we thought about, we thought about the prognosis from different staging. So we wanted really hard to stage these uh, masses. So we agreed with the ADNEX that this is an advanced stage. So we thought if it is advanced stage, so her prognosis from the ovarian masses for the five years is going to be in the figure of 20%. This, if the bowel is early stage, it's going to be better, much better diagnosis. If the lung is late stage, because the lymph nodes, they stage the lung as N2. So that means there was a mediastinal lymph node, no contralateral lymph node. And that will make the staging much worse for the lung, which is about 15, 20%. So the decision was to do an operation. And of course, we liaise the lung with the lung MDT. The lung MDT decided not to operate. But we did the same operation because she was as well symptomatic, so she had pain. So we decided to take the ovarian mass, do a staging, and do as well the excision of the colon. I'm not saying that Daniela's decision is wrong or right, but this is what happened on the time. Yeah, because sometimes if you have symptoms, you have no other choice, of course. And yeah. I think she was like 70 years, 70... 70 something years, yeah. Yeah, years old. So... So she had a THP, so infragastic cominectectomy, bilateral with the lymph nodes, uh, periotic lymphadenectomy, left hemi and sigmoid uh, colectomy with Hartman's. 
So that she was a carcinosarcoma of the ovary stage as 3B. She was a bowel adenocarcinoma Duke B, no lymph nodes, from the 74 pelvic and biotic mesenteric lymph nodes all being negative. And uh, she had a positive peritoneal washings. And the lung cancer, uh, she was T1B uh, N2. And the patient's currently having chemotherapy for ovarian and lung cancer. Any comments? She's quite unlucky, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I do not have any comment to that because, of course, that she has a high risk of the recurrent disease of carcinosarcoma. But otherwise, maybe there is also then an option to add radiotherapy for the lung after she will finish the chemotherapy. Yeah. But um, probably there is also the risk of recurrent disease, yeah. so we are happy when she will respond to, to palliative chemo. Yeah, yeah. So we move to the next case from St. Thomas's as well. 52-year-old lady, a bit younger. She, three years ago, she had diagnosed with stage 1A clear cell carcinoma of the ovary. It was an incidental finding at surgery for benign fibroids. And she had a second surgery to complete the staging on time, and that included 13 pelvic uh, and parotid lymph nodes, uh, and the OB negative. She had no chemotherapy, and she had small bowel destruction recently, a month ago, or oh, three months ago. Um, and the surgeons, uh, she was admitted to another hospital. She was treated by uh, general surgeons. They opened up, and they just did adhesiolysis, but they couldn't find any disease. But while she was investigated for the bowel obstruction, there was a three centimetre uh, high periotic uh, lymph nodes on the CT. I think we are referring oh yeah. to this, <laughs> probably. Yeah, there, you can see. Okay. Yeah. Which they described that it is below the splenic um, artery, close to the celiac trunk, and uh, close to the left pararenal, uh, close to the left adrenal gland. So the CT report suggested that could be actually as well a paraganglioma. So we, this is on the CT bet. So what's the next step? What do you think this biopsy is difficult? Yeah, I think there is a high um, risk that it will be recurrent disease because you removed about you... 12 lymph nodes from this radio. And we know that the chemosensitivity uh, of clear cell cancer is not optimal, so we would... Uh, she never had chemo. She never had chemo. Just yeah, exactly, yeah. but I mean for yeah, the for, recurrent disease. Yeah. So we would discuss with her first to start with the surgery to remove the mass, if it's possible, we would probably do something like systematic lymphadenectomy if there is still some lymphatic tissue. And after that, in that case, we, we must discuss with her whether they are free margin or not, because sometimes the clear cell is so embedding the vessels that you don't know about the free margin behind the aorta. So you are not certain about the free margin. And in that case, we would probably, instead of chemotherapy, discuss with radiotherapeutists radiotherapy, because the clear cell is more sensitive to radiotherapy if there is some... What about the suspicion that could be a paraganglioma or something totally different? We will do the surgery. We will know it. Um, with the paraganglioma, there is a risk of... If it is adrenal gland mass, I mean, that can lead to Addison syndrome or lead to serious complications. So what yeah, the but in from the, neuro, from the endocrinology team suggested that we need to do some oh, investigation. Oh, can you speak up a bit more as the thing, because you can't hear you properly. Okay. Better. Thanks. So what the MDT suggested is to do some tests to make sure this is not an endocrine tumour. What do you feel about this? Yeah, but uh, if I remember the age, she is 52 years. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Still can be. And the other reason you write that could be a clear cell recurrence, but she was staged as 1A with... Yeah, 
But with, uh, with um, not really optimal number of removed lymph nodes, That's although correct. it is still That's defined I agree. as I agree with that. optimal lymphadenectomy. So we try to, do, to have the biopsy, but we will discuss with her to do it through, through surgery, yeah. not uh, through cut biopsy, but surgery, because if it's, for instance, like lymphoma, anyhow, you need to extirpate the lymph node. Yeah, I agreed with you, management, in the MDT, but they disagreed with me, and they suggested that this could be one of these, either a recurrent uh, clear cell or paraganglioma, and they went with a long series of investigations, uh, including uh, plasma metanephrines, uh, which was normal, plasma no, uh, no methadrenaline, which was normal, plasma metadrenaline, which was normal, urine steroid, which was normal, and they've done as well an a, uh, MIBG uh, uh, scan, which was as well normal. So in the end, we ended up taking it out which you, we are here above the renal vein, above the renal artery, and that's the IMB, and actually here very close to the spleen. The pancreas all reflected up, and this is the bed of the lymph nodes. We totally agree, that's lymph nodes taken out, we totally agree with the, we've done as well the lymph nodes, in the, all the series lymph nodes, as you suggested, Daniela. The margins cannot be guaranteed, there's no way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now she's having chemo. Um, the radiotherapy was discussed with the clinical oncologist, but they decided actually just to give chemo for now, especially if the CT is negative. Yeah. Clear cell. The current clear cell. Oh, oh, well. <laughs> I think that may have to be the last. This case. is the last one. This is a very, case very quickly then from Imperial. Time. Yeah, from Imperial College. This is a case which uh, I was involved in, but uh, she, this is Christina Fotopolo case. A young lady, 29-year-old patient, who had a unilateral ovarian tumor 10 centimeter with elevated alpha fetal protein in thousands figures. The patient otherwise was excellent, no tumor-related symptoms, and she had abdominal distension. She had a fertility uh, sparing surgery in her local hospital, and uh, she had a diagnosis of germ cell ovarian tumor, which I think at that point was immature teratoma. The alpha fetoprotein never completely uh, normalized. Four months later, uh, she had a peritoneal relapse uh, in pelvis and upper abdomen with the uh, AFB of 216. She had four cycles of PEP, and eight months later, she had a peritoneal lymph, uh, lymphogenic relapse. Uh, she had PI, chemotherapy, progress, disease, and, uh, on radio and radiology. Uh, but normal AFB patient uh, had symptoms of bowel obstruction, shortness of the breath, abdominal distension, and pain, and she had this CT. Okay, do we need a Okay, so what we can see there, yes, there's a mass in the peritoneum, go down, and what is specific, what, what, okay, and there is scalping here in the posterior part of the liver, and what is uh, really uh, characteristic of a growing teratoma syndrome, you can see that there is calcification uh, due to the maturation. So that is suggestive of uh, growing teratoma syndrome and not mature recurrence. Sorry. Okay. So she had a surgery which, include, which included uh, in-block resection, uterus, adnexa, pelvic bladder, peritoneum, rigto, uh, sigmoid, primary and, uh, uh, primary, uh, with primary end-to-end -end anastomosis. Bulky, she had bulky pyotic lymph nodes, peritoneal stri uh, stripping, right, left, diaphragmatic, uh, and Morrison's pouch stripping, removal tumor of liver capsule, and omentectomy um, in block with a spleen, she removal of the tumor lesser sac, and removal of the mesenteric uh, root tumor free. You can see what you looked at the CT. This is the diaphragm, we're looking up the patient. These masses are all from the diaphragm. And this is the diaphragm stripped. And the patient is doing well. The histology was all uh, features of mature teratoma tissue, no immature component and she had a remission 26 months later. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ahmed. Thank you very much, Daniela. And thank you, Isabel. Sorry to cut you a bit short. Where's Luca? Is she not? Yeah. Oh, right, you are here. Sorry, because I saw the MCQ up there. Luca Savelli, uh, welcome. Nice to see you. Um, Luca's going to run through some images. Um, we're not sure if he's got his slides sorted out at this point. How are you doing? I'm just waiting. I'm saying, have you got your slides organized? Okay, good afternoon. My name is Luca Savelli. After last depressing talk, I've been asked to give you a small talk on just images. And this is why you won't see many data. I've decided to, with the help of Antonia, who has given me some images, I've picked up some images, some cases, interesting just to uh, speculate a little bit on how we work in everyday clinical practice. Just a question, how many of you uh, use the Adnex model at least once a day? No? Two? Thierry? Uh, once a week? You don't, how many of you use, uh, apply the Adnex model and use physically the program once a day while scanning? No? Or once a week? One, two, three, four, five, ten people. Once a month. Less than, okay. Arthur, thank you. <laughs> okay, just images. I must admit, I don't know exactly what Dirk meant why, when he invited me to give this talk. But, so I had to imagine, and I hope I'm in, in topic. Uh, we have heard much in these days about simple use, easy descriptors, relative risks. RMI, logistic regression to ADNEX model, and so on. But in everyday clinical practice, the way in which we perform, we, we make the diagnosis is by using pattern recognition. That means evaluating the specific B mode and Doppler features of a given ADNEX RMS and comparing what we see and what we are able to see to pick up with the library of, of images that we have uh, collected during the years of experience. Uh, and that's it. Some, the problem comes when the mess is difficult to classify. And we know that about 7-8% of the messes uh, are difficult to classify. And even for an expert sonologist, it is not possible to say whether these are benign or malignant. And what to do in these messes? Well, it is not that sure what to do. Someone advocates the use of ADNIX, but some others are convinced that even if you are forced in those in that 7% of the messes to say whether the mess is benign or malignant, uh, your choice will be right, correct, more often than with the use of um, simple rules or logistic regression tool, for example. Uh, we have seen some cases the, this morning in which Adnix model was right, actually, but this is, for example, a case in which logistic regression tool or the Adnix model could be wrong. But for every expert sonologist could uh, recognize, will recognize the corpus luteum in this, okay? Because there is more than the uh, features that can be uh, depicted and uh, put all together in a, in, a, in a rule, in a program that can be uh, found, that can be evaluated by, by means of our eyes. Uh, for example, the movement, the consistency uh, of the mass, pain evoked, 
um, correlation with the cycle, uh, age of the patient, and so on. This, these are other uh, examples in which it is not possible only to state whether the mass is benign or malignant, but it is possible for an ex-personologist even to hypothesize the histology of the mass. And these cases are corpora lutea, dermoids, uh, endometriotic cysts, hydrosalpinsis, and peritoneal pseudocysts. For these specific five types of adnexal masses, it is possible to, well, we could dare, Lille would, would use this term, we could dare to hypothesize the histological feature, not only if the mass is benign or malignant. And dermoids are among those uh, masses that are very difficult to classify. It is, could be even difficult to state whether these are unilocular or unilocular solid and in fact are overrepresented in the fifth category of uh, unclassifiable masses. But for an ex-personologist, it is easy to say that these are benign and these are dermoids. Other, again, other cases, hydrosalpinsis. Uh, these are easy to, to, to be uh, identified and recognized as uh, masses coming from the fallopian tube and not the ovary, uh, fluid field, incomplete septation, uh, beads on a string, and so on. Peritoneal pseudosis, as I told you, are easy to be classified, but if you, uh, if you put them in logistic regression 2 model, for example, some of these will give you a high risk of malignancy, because, for example, an ovary entrapped inside the peritoneal pseudocyst could uh, look like a solid tissue. And these can be vascularized. So some peritoneal pseudocysts um, appear as multilocular solid masses, which have 60% um, risk of malignancy. But for an ex-personologist, these are very easy to classify. Other cases. Uh, these are classical, uh, this is a, a classic uh, endometriotic cyst. We can say it is benign and it, it is an endometriotic cyst. And when you, we, we, we uh, evaluate this, we are correct in 98% 90%, of the cases. Caroline Van uh, Holzbeek has demonstrated that uh, unilocular or multilocular with up to five locules cyst with ground glass eicosinicity in a premenopausal woman uh, is an endometriotic cyst, and the accuracy of this statement is around 97%. Of course, endometriotic cysts can have a lot of different uh, appearances. Beside these classical endometriotic cysts, there are less classical ones with irregular uh, walls, with echoic projections inside the cyst, like this, or cases in which the uh, content of the cyst is not that uniformly ground glass, like in this case, because of hemorrhage inside the cyst, because of ovulation close to the cyst, or acute or chronic inflammation, and so on. The cyst can, can undergo a lot of uh, histological processes that can change the appearance of the cyst over time. But for an expert sonologist, again, these are very easy to classify. And even so, and these are that typical that even the echogenic projections or portions of the cystic content of the cyst uh, are almost pathognomonic, smooth and hyperechoic. These are very typical of endometriotic cysts. Sometimes they can resemble a multilocular cyst, uh, but it, it is clear that they can um, produce adhesions, they can be adherent one to, to the other, and uh, these cases, this is a typical case of so-called kissing ovaries. These are in reality two different endometriotic cysts and not, not one. We have heard 
already much about this, so I don't I won't go through this, but uh, it has been uh, demonstrated, we have done some research on this, that populations inside the pseudolized endometriomas are quite typical and different from populations of borderline tumors, for example, or stage first uh, ovarian cancers. These are smooth, and if you follow up the pseudolized endometriomas or masses that you think are in the, uh, the pseudolized endometriomas, they will grow during pregnancy until 25, 28 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, populations will grow in number and in height. Uh, they will become more and more vascularized, while borderline tumors usually have a slower slope of uh, growth. And then they start shrinking, the, they shrink in volume, and then even the solid projections become uh, smaller and smaller. And they tend to disappear after pregnancy. Another example of changing endometriotic cysts are uh, um, those after or during continuous um, estroprogestin therapy. They tend to shrink and the content of the cyst changes. This has not been uh, described yet in scientific literature, but it is uh, common knowledge that the endometriotic cysts after uh, progestin therapy or even estroprogestin therapy tend to shrink, or some of them tend to, to reduce the, the volume, and the content becomes less uniform, less um, ground glass, and hyperechoic dots appear inside the cysts, and uh, hyperechoic foci tend to appear on the aligning on the wall of the cyst, most probably for the position of, uh, of uh, calcium or, or something like this. It is not known why these hyperechoic foci appear on the wall of old endometriotic cysts. Of course, there are cysts in which even an expert sonologist is in trouble, and those with papillary projections, again, are a classical case in which benign cysts like adenofibromas or borderline tumors or even invasive stage first uh, ovarian cancers can be can have similar appearances, and these are difficult to classify sometimes. But we have heard today that not all the papillae look the same, and we can go beyond the term papilla and analyze the characteristics of the papillary projections. There are papillary projections that look benign, like these ones. These are flattened. These are hyperechoic, let's say, to be clear, more echogenic than the wall of the cyst. They can produce small, tiny um, cones of shadows. Usually these are devoid of blast vessels, and these are due to um, the position of uh, collagen okay, in the stroma of the papilla. And resemble some like stones or something which is hard uh, by touch. While malignant papillae look soft, uh, they, these are larger in number, these are taller, and the profile of the papilla uh, is, resembles this cauliflower, okay? The profile is irregular. In these malignant papillary projections, you can find some small, tiny, anechoic uh, areas most probably because there is a lot of glands inside the papilla, which produce, uh, producing a lot of mucus or serum. And this is why uh, if you enlarge the papilla, you can find an echoic or hypoechoic spaces. Of course, these are larger in number, and they grow easily in malignant masses, while in benign masses, these are small, tiny, low in number and not vascularized. 
the importance is to not, not to stop at stating this is a unilocular solid mass, but enlarge the papilla, obtain the maximum from the ultrasound machine and the image. Because the papilla will tell you which kind of mass it is. So just to summarize some of the most important features of the papillary projections, these are the benign papillary projections. These are usually small. These are usually few, less than four, in number, no vascular uh, traces, and can have a cone of shadow. And you can be quite sure that these are benign masses. Suspicious papillary projections, that means you can find them in borderline tumors or even uh, stage first um, ovarian cancer, invasive ovarian cancer. These are taller, these are uh, high in number vascularized and do not produce any cone of shadow. And the echogenicity, I forgot to, say, to uh, add this feature, echogenicity of the malignant papilla is the same of the ovarian parenchyma, that is the same of the wall of the cyst, while the echogenicity of the papillary projections in adenofibromas, for example, is higher, is hyperechoic. Another kind of tumor in which even an expert sonologist can be in trouble is the one that is entirely solid or predominantly solid. We, we know that the risk of malignancy is about uh, 50%, but sometimes it is difficult to classify this. Uh, but there are some features, even in solid tumors, that can help. For example, the presence of cone of shadow. Every time you see a cone of shadow, then this feature is a st has a strong impact in reducing the risk that the mass being malignant. You find them in fibromas of the ovaries, in dermoids, and in very few other masses, occasionally seen in masses which are not benign. Okay. Uh, Doppler helps a lot in, solid t uh, solid in entirely solid masses, uh, not only the color score, but in this case, even the distribution of the blood vessels is very important because, uh, as you know, some of the entirely solid masses are metastases of the ovaries, and the distribution of the blood vessels in a metastasis uh, is peculiar. The so-called lead vessel that most probably represents the entering of the vessels from the IP uh, ligament, infundibular pelvic ligament, into the vessel and the branching of the vessels inside the uh, ovary. That is typical of uh, Krukenberg tumors or, let's say, secondary tumors, metastasis. Okay. This, together with some other features, can help in, in the differential diagnosis of purely solid masses. Fibromas of the ovaries are 90% of the cases monolateral, while ovarian cancerinomas and secondary tumors, metastases of the ovaries, are always often bilateral. The ecotexture is different. Homogeneous uh, or heterogeneous will help you. The presence of, of cone of shadow, look at the external contour. Ovarian fibromas, we have heard from the pathologist Zanoni, have a smooth surface, while Ovarian tumors, malignant tumors, have a rough, irregular surface. I have told you about the distribution of blood vessels and cone of shadow. Of course, the color score helps. And then there are more even the, some rare tumors in which we will always be wrong. <laughs> and this is the, uh, the, the challenge that, that keeps us studying and Luckily, there will be always some, some, some mistake uh, in front of us. For example, this is multilocular solid mass. What do you think it is? Would you give this mass a low or a high risk of malignancy? This is the last case. What do you think? Who would classify this as benign? Known, who would classify this as malignant? I guess, multilocular solid, vascularized. Uh, 
and actually stroma ovaries are overrepresented in the false positive cases of malignancy. Uh, if this, this is just an example of uh, stroma ovaries and tachomas, for example, solid, tissues, solid masses, highly vascularized. These, for sure, will always be in the group of masses that we easily misunderstand, misdiagnosed as malignant. But we have research has gone a lot, uh, a little bit uh, through this, and we have demonstrated that stroma ovaries can some of these be recognized because of the presence of these hyperechoic small balls which are vascularized. And so if you can, I can go maybe uh, back. If you recognize some hyperechoic areas and you find them vascularized, well, very few masses have hyperechoic areas which have blood vessels, and in my experience only, you will find them only in stroma ovaries or those dermoids that show some tiny vessels in the Rokitansky nodule. Okay. These are called stroma pers. Thank you very much. I hope I was in time. Thank you. No, Luca, thank you very much. I think it's really important, actually, to remember that, I mean, as you know, I love pattern recognition. So there are rules and models, but actually a lot of ultrasound is, uh, is about patterns and recognizing these patterns and, and um, using the maximum benefits of the machine. I always remember Elan Timor used to say, you know, make it bigger, see all the features, you know. You're right. You know, so I think it's really important. Any comments on that? Um, I know we are a little short of time. Whilst um, we're asking for comments, um, could those who are running the MCQ sort of make their way um, over to the podium? It would be very helpful. Any, any specific questions for Luca Savelli on, on the images? Okay, Luca, that's, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, it was exactly what was wanted. In the meantime, we will do already the prize draw. Uh, Antonia, you have the innocent hands, so you can draw the winner out of the box. Okay, so for the winner of the boot, Visits Antonia, who's the winner? The winner is I've got other couples. Yes, ten kiste Maria. <coughs> Shall I pronounce it uh, from Belgium? Uh, Maria van Steenkiste. <laughs> does, does she work at KU Leuven? Maria, yeah. ben je nog in de zaal? Dan mag je naar hier komen. Fix. Het is een fix. Bedankt, Antonia. So, is it, um, are we going to introduce you, Dirk? Nee, jij mocht het uh, geven. Ah, daar is het. So, um, proficiat. <laughs> So she's a famous gynecologist in Flanders, so thank you. I can't believe, can't believe the prize went to a Belgian, Dirk. Um, there anyway, was Dirk, no bribery involved, so... So my last thing as chairman, just want to hand it back to Dirk, who's going to uh, I, give you some take-home messages and um, close the meeting. So I will hand over Dirk, and I'm not going to go and sit at the front now, so thank you. Okay, Tom, thank you so much for chairing two days. I know this must have been terribly tiring, and uh, you've done a great uh, job. And not only this, uh, but I'll show it in a minute. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for coming from 28 different countries to here. Uh, the countries are here again, so these were the people in the room. And apart from that, we had... Uh, uh, many people following us by live streaming, and it was very nice last night to get emails from the United States, LA, 
and people saying it was really like being with you. So the people with, uh, in the background have done a beautiful job and thanks to GE for this. But uh, they really made the live streaming very, very efficient. And this means that in a few weeks' time, you will find the videos of most of the lectures on our website and also on the Follison Club. So thank you for this. Then, of course, I would like to thank all the speakers, and I will not go over them, but they are very well known by now. The speakers that uh, have spoken over the last two days, as well as other uh, people like our statistical team, the civil engineers and software engineers, under the heading of Sabine van Uffel, Bart de Moor, Jan van Bakel, and Ben van Kalster. And then there's the group of IOTA studies, and I'm very grateful to them, and all information will be on the website. So in total, we have included more than 21,000 patients in different studies, and I know how difficult the IOTA 5 study was, and tomorrow we will have the meeting in the hospital for the investigators, so this will be from 9 to 12. It's not here at the university, it's really the main entrance of the hospital, and then you can follow the science to Saal Brückner. So we have 3,500 certified IOTA members after this exam, so we will update the slide very soon, I hope. The papers, participants from 28 countries, and the downloads. So the Congress, in my view, has been very successful, and it's really a consolidation of almost 20 years of collaboration within IOTA, and I cannot show all people, so this was a nice image I found of uh, some of key figures. But they highlight that uh, in IOTA there's a culture of trust, respect and friendship. We start always met with a consensus meeting and terms and definitions paper is a base of everything. Uh, we have good study protocols, statisticians and prospective studies. We try to integrate young and complementary colleagues into the study team. We are always very critical, and some of us are even more critical before submitting any manuscripts for publication. We are not pointing to any person in specific, specifically, but uh, it's good to be critical. It's always better that you don't regret having submitted a paper if you find errors afterwards. So follow the technical evolutions, and that, that's thanks to Tom who put us on Facebook, on Twitter, we are also active not only in ultrasound, but also in other imaging and also uh, liquid biopsy research, as you've seen yesterday. But finally, it's really the impact on clinical practice and patient care that's the main aim of IOTA. And if you go to Facebook now, then you will see that the whole conference has been summarized already on Facebook. So every lecture, you may wonder, what is Tom doing with his... Uh, laptop all the time. So he's typing all the time. Yes, he's making summaries of every lecture and it's all on Facebook together with pictures. So it's really very nice to follow this and thank you for this. <laughs> and then of course I would like to especially thank Wouter and Kiara who've done an enormous job of preparing this conference. And not only this conference but also for IOTA 5 and other studies. So they're really been working day and night. And the conclusions for me are that training, experience, but also meetings like this are very important to become better ultrasound examiners, to become better doctors, to become better uh, diagnostic experts. And we also learn a lot from these conferences. To me, it was uh, very, very interesting. And I haven't seen any weak session in my view uh, some um, people may differ in opinion, but uh, I was reassured that half of the audience at least think that benign easy descriptors may work very well as a first step and that the next model could be very useful as a second step test. We've seen that interactions with the pathologist uh, is pivotal and we've seen very exciting new developments like the validation of the next model user-friendly apps, models in ultrasound machines incorporated, that we can use ultrasound for staging, that we can use MRI, and that we can use it in different ways and even more effectively 
with new developments, as well as PET CT. And then finally, and this is the very last slide, I would like to welcome you all in Leuven in April 2019. The dates have not been fixed yet, but uh, I'm pretty certain that by then we will have collected a lot of new information. And there's uh, four persons I would like to especially thank, and this is Christine de Keuler, and maybe you can come to here. Marlene Kassarts, who's really been driving force behind the whole conference, Linda Simons, and Diane Wolpert. Thank you so much. And also Tina from Tini Bautenfeeste, who was responsible for the stage, because maybe you've noticed that the stage is completely different than the previous time. I think it's much nicer with the logo, with the lights. And this is Tini Bautenfeeste, who is responsible for this. Thank you all. And then you're all very welcome at the town hall in Leuven. Leuven is a medieval town. It's very nice to go to the city center, especially in the evening, because the town hall is nicely illuminated. But the major of the city expects us, or his represents, uh, it's probably it's, uh, uh, his uh, second hand, uh, or the second person in charge, he will invite us for a reception, and this is uh, starting at 6.30, so you can take a bus that will bring you directly to the town center, and it's really exactly in the center of town. So, I think to, I wanted to express all the auditorium to congratulate, to thank you for this excellent organization. Thank you. And uh, to our big chairman, our big chairman, Professor Tom Bourne, we want to congratulate because uh, you are strong, you give you. passion, and uh, thank you so much. We would like to invite all of us to take a picture yes. here. Yes. Why don't I we... Are you the investigators for a picture? Yeah. Would you like to come to the podium, all of you? Oh. We can try to... Yeah, can we can yes. stay there and uh, to... Is there a photographer? <laughs> can we have a little bit more light? Can we have more light in the room? Then we can take some pictures. Good afternoon, uh, and it's a time to close the live streaming after these two days here in Leuven. Uh, I hope uh, these uh, different sessions and lectures were informative for you. So you can watch these videos on replay on the Hayota website or on the Volusion Club. So talk to you soon on the web. Goodbye.